fireworks happened, and so did I. We, meaning my mother, father and me, initially lived in a tiny bedsit that didn't have proper heating. We moved very quickly, though, to a ground floor flat. My mother says that we had so little money in those times that the priest, who they'd hastily arranged to minister their shotgun wedding, came round and visited them and felt so sorry for their economic position that he gave them the deposit for their wedding back. The flat had sash windows that opened from the bottom and the priest apparently stuck his head in to say hello and was greeted with piles of washing laid out on maidens. My mother and father slept in the same room that they lived in during the day and didn't move into the other room they had to spare because they didn't have enough furniture to fill it. My mother had just finished touring the country playing a bear in Mother Hubbard with Bernard Hill who would later come to worldwide acclaim when he played Theoden in the Lord of the Rings films. My father was struggling for work and had to sign on. This was the time of the 80s where Tory scum, as my father would say, or the Conservative Party, as my mother would say, was instrumental, depending on how you see it, in presiding over either the worst levels of unemployment the UK had experienced for a good while, or one of the biggest displays of collective human laziness. Whichever way you choose to view it, this period for us was marked with money being tight. Not enough money for brand name cigarettes, tight. No spending the night in the pub, tight. My dad tells me that whilst money may have been lacking, there were high points in the day for him. As he was signing on, he was around at home and he used the time productively to show me lots of things. He would sit with me for hours and show me picture after picture of landscapes, colours, architecture, animals, cartoons, photos of family, photos of people, art of all kinds and types, design books, kids books. I was given a wide variety of visual interests as a child and as a result I have very specific ideas on aesthetics. Aesthetic sensibility is big with me. I like things to look certain ways and by virtue of that they feel better or worse for me to live with. To give you an example, my bookcase is ordered not by author, genre or alphabetical order. It's arranged aesthetically, by colour, into a rainbow arrangement. Does that make it harder to find a book when you are looking for something specific? Of course it does. That's the point. That you're forced to browse and to drink in the whole picture. The rest of the time, when you're not browsing, you pass a rainbow scene day in and day out. I'll gladly take the hit on time efficiency for that happy scene any day. Like I said, aesthetic sensibility is big with me. My cultural exposure wasn't limited to the visual. Music of all kinds and genres was played for me. Classical, rock and roll, soul music, funk and folk. I was exposed to opera, musicals, hymns, Christmas carols, kraut rock and nursery rhymes. All the music they had on records, mostly my father's collection, was pulled out of its sleeve and played whilst I sat in their laps and began to potter about the flat. Both my mother and father love music. My mother likes religious music, hymns, carols. She also likes musicals and a random assortment of other artists from Barbara Bush to Samantha Fox and from the cowboy junkies to Cliff Richard to Don McLean. My mother doesn't sing, but she loves sing-alongs. My father rarely sings at all, but loves music, and it is he who would have called me Jethro, after Jethro Tull, had I not had the lucky escape of being born as a girl. At some point I was taught to read, and I know that I took a big interest in books from an early age. How do I know this? My father illustrated the learning to read process in a 19-panel comic strip, a copy of which currently hangs in my landing. In the panel, I drag around a giant stuffed tortoise, I pull my mum's hair, get dressed up to go out, I steal a cookie, I come home and immediately look for my books, I run around with no pants on, I object to being washed, I have some milk and fall asleep. The comic strip is entitled A Day in the Life of Rebecca Seabury, aged one and a bit. Thus begins the documentation in art form of the person that is and isn't Rebecca Seabury. By the time I will reach 35, I will have been captured at different ages and stages of life, in stylized comic strips. My portrait will have been painted, and I'll have been the subject of poems and songs written by at least four different individuals, all of whom will portray me slightly differently, call attention to different details of my personality, actions and behaviours, and through their expressions of me, they will all reveal aspects of themselves too, whether they realise it or not. So when I tell you that I've been amused for creativity for as long as I can remember, I am one of the few people who can say that without any hyperbole. In fact, I've been amused technically longer than I can remember. 
My father tells me that beside the shotgun wedding, there was also a shotgun christening. My father is an atheist. My mother is Roman Catholic. My father says that we, meaning him, me and my mother, visited my mother's family in Blackpool and they surprised him with a pre-planned christening of me. A surprise christening is sort of like a surprise birthday party, except in this case your firstborn gets inducted into a major religion without your say or your side of the family there to witness it. He was nonplussed, but without backup he was just one lone voice in the wilderness, without a hope, or indeed a prayer, of staring down a whole family of Irish Catholic immigrants. I was christened. Shortly after, we moved to Blackpool and rented a little bungalow on the site of the factory of a couple of my granny's oldest and closest family friends, collectively known as the Haslams. The Haslams comprised of Gil Haslam and Sheila Haslam. Gil was the quintessential working class self-made man. He was a millionaire and owned a factory called Gilbert's. Sheila was his educated housewife. Sheila and my granny went way back, living on the same street at one point in Mearside. They got to know each other as they attended the same church and their kids played together as children. Gil, who had started out with a wheelbarrow collecting junk and fencing it on for profit, had made a meteoric rise out of his relatively humble beginnings. And when he did, the Haslams didn't live on the same street as the Carrolls anymore. But they did remain friends. My mother got a job cleaning Sheila's house and my father started working in social services. My mother says that the rent for the cottage came to the same amount as the pay for her cleaning job and that Sheila and her would do a silly dance of monies where Sheila would pay my mother for her cleaning job and my mother would immediately pass it back to pay for the rent. They could have called it evens, I guess, but both parties were anxious for everything to be above broad and proper, so they went through with this absurd ritual for around two years. Both women were working class, educated, teetotal, religious and proud. While we were living at the cottage, my parents saved up the £3,000 deposit for a small mid-terrace house in the South Shore area of Blackpool. The house originally had a small front room, a kitchen, and downstairs bathroom, and upstairs there were three smallish bedrooms. It had a small square front garden, and a back garden that backed onto an alley. I have a few photographs of us all together at the house, but not many, and shortly after moving in, I would watch red-eyed from the front room bay window as my father strode up the street, with his black Sally Army Mac flapping around in the wind. He turned round at the end of the street, waved sadly at me, turned the corner and never came back. This is my earliest childhood memory. The memory of this, though vivid and sad, had a cinematic element to it that cannot be understated. My father had been to drama school in Birmingham and while studying acting there, he had learned how to move with confidence. So, whilst I recall crying my eyes out, I also recall the Mac flapping in the wind, propelled by his stride. His slow turn, his hand stiffly raised in a stoic but firm wave, and the sunlight streaming across his sunglasses. I couldn't see his eyes. It was another cinematic moment in the life of Rebecca Seabury, aged three and a half. I spent the moment on my tiptoes, holding onto the window sill. The moment whilst affecting me was not choreographed by me or for me. The moment was spent alone. Sometimes if I remember that moment and try to strip out the context and just visualise it, I imagine my father as a Clint Eastwood style cowboy saying farewell just before he goes to seek his fortune or to right a wrong in a neighbouring town where he will lay down the law and restore justice. Of course in reality he was taking himself to a bed sit flat in St Anne's but the bed in the flat had a pull down mechanism that was pretty fascinating and I got the privilege of playing with putting it up and down and watching it disappear into the wall and reappear again on the floor. I reasoned that being able to see the mechanism of a Murphy bed close up and in Technicolor was nearly as good as the good, the bad and the ugly. The flat had a small box bedroom with a bunk bed which is where I stayed when I came for the weekend. <laughs>